my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page physics center and school of astrophysics and astronomy and youtube channel pitam kumar das i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics seminar so good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good morning to all those who are watching this program live from usa so hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic so we are trying uh, adjust with this new normal situation as you know that uh, we are staying in a corona pandemic situation it's very difficult time for all of us so uh, this is the new uh, type of experience we are having so in this situation it's uh, it's hard to uh, continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start our uh, online program i think you have already come to know that the department of physics patna university of science and technology has started its online program including online international physics webinars and we have successfully completed our 170th international physics webinar and today it's our 171th uh, 71st international physics webinar today i'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between the department of physics patna university of science and technology and the department of physics and astronomy university of toledo usa and we have with us here today dr sanjoy vikare sir professor and chair director of the minor in renewable energy department of physics and astronomy university of toledo Yes, and he has already connected with us, so I'd like to welcome our speaker, sir. Good evening and good morning to your part, and thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. And it's my honor and privilege to host you in my international physics seminar, sir. So, for those who are new, I'd like to inform you all that we have divided our webinar into three parts. First of all, I'd like to introduce our speaker with all of you, and then our speaker will deliver his piece. and at the end we have a discussion session in that time anybody can join with us and you can ask question by commenting also i think you have already come to know the title of this today's international physics webinar the title is the returning to a sustainable human society and our speaker is dr sanjoy v khare sir professor and chair director of the minor in renewable energy department of physics and astronomy university of toledo toledo usa and you can see his educational and employment records uh, he has completed his uh, bachelor degree in physics from university of bombay uh, in 1987 and then masters uh, in physics from the in iit uh, uh, bombay and uh, his phd from university of maryland and uh, he is currently working as a chair of department of physics and astronomy university of toledo ohio state uh, in usa and uh, from 2015 uh, april to uh, now he is working as a professor at department of physics and astronomy in university college and from uh, uh, 2010 to 2020 he worked as a director professional science masters in photovoltaics and uh, from 2009 to present uh, he is working as a director of minor in re renewable energy research interest their research involves the application of appropriate theoretical and computational techniques to understand the material system of significant experimental interest it is uh, encompasses prediction of new phenomena explanation of existing data and collaboration with experimentalists on such topics as statistical mechanics of surface dynamics diffusion on surfaces and in bulk materials computational of structural elastic mechanical energetic electronic and optical properties of crystalline dissolved uh, micro and nano structure materials with diverse application in hard coatings solar cells and electronic devices and multi ferrets varied theoretical techniques and uh, utilized primarily based on quantum density functional theory dft there's competition Uh, another area of activity in global energy supply and its connection to the economy and human quality of life you can see is award and recognition recognized for achievement in scientific research and as a industry leader by marcus quis who in 2017 graduate research award 1996 awarded by the american vacuum society for outstanding scholarship in vacuum society science and technology Institute Medal 1989 awarded by the Indian Institute of Technology IIT Bombay uh, India for the most outstanding student for the MSc physics class and you can see his uh, publication list 
he has more than 75 publications and uh, his citation is uh, more than 2000 and his uh, AC index is 29. Grant funding, you can see his uh, funding and uh, his supervision and act other act activities. He has, he has uh, more than 14 uh, PhD students and uh, currently four and uh, 17 MS students and undergrad about 11. So thanks all of your patience and uh, it's our time to go to our speakers. So sir, thanks again for joining with us and thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. It's your time, sir. You can start your session. So uh, uh, let me. Okay, uh, Dr. Kumar Das, is everything uh, properly visible? And yeah. can you hear me? Okay, just uh, please uh, hide the option. There is the option. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before I start, uh, I would like to express thanks and gratitude uh, to Dr. Kumar Das for uh, inviting me. Uh, to make this uh, remote presentation uh, and uh, give me an opportunity to present some ideas which I hope you find interesting, thought-provoking, and hopefully uh, they will have a very positive impact on your lifestyle. So this is a little different than a, a technical talk uh, of physics research. Uh, if anybody is interested in my main research activities, uh, the website is listed and all my uh, research de description and publications are available to view. Um, and I would also like to uh, thank uh, Pabna University in Bangladesh uh, for making this uh, possible. Uh, the title of the talk, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kumar Das has already mentioned, Returning to a Sustainable Human Society. Uh, the most important topics uh, or themes of this discussion are population, peak energy, energy returned on energy invested, effect of entropy on human society, uh, what is the definition of GDP, energy, and how it relates to uh, human development index, and then the redefinition of a good life from what is currently thought of by economists uh, to be a good life. I would like to acknowledge uh, many, many fellow students of sustainable society related issues uh, too numerous to acknowledge individually. Uh, so there is some original thought and material and mixed with work of others in this presentation. Uh, so uh, first in line are four distinct sustainability challenges. These are global, not restricted to the US or Bangladesh or any other country. So first is climate change is approaching. We are already seeing some effects of it uh, and they are expected to become more intense in 10, 15 years and they will last hundreds of years. Uh, peak production of total energy. This is approaching in five to 15 years uh, and certainly the consequences will be quite serious and more immediate uh, than global climate change, which will uh, go on for a long time. Uh, peak production of portable energy, uh, think of it mostly uh, for your cars, trucks, buses, ships, uh, and the primary source is crude oil. So some of the best crude oil is already gone, sweet uh, uh, crude oil. Uh, in, uh, it, it peaked probably about five to 10 years ago, and now we are finding harder and harder oil and it causes difficulty for our lifestyles and the world economy. Uh, so again, the consequences are immediate, uh, more immediate than even this. And then there is peak of other materials, honeybees collapse, for example, uh, grains, we find agriculture harder and harder to do. Many species have already gone, topsoil in many countries is being depleted very rapidly, fertile land, uh, fresh water. Uh, many of these elements are either in the past, the peak production is in the past or it will happen soon enough. Uh, again, the consequences are uh, fairly serious. Uh, I've listed these as least important to most important. Doesn't mean this is not important. Uh, it's just to give you a scale of uh, these things are even more important and more sudden uh, 
is their impact. So these challenges lead to opportunities, uh, and every challenge can be used to create a transformative change in entire now this time world society. It's not these challenges are not limited to a country. Uh, this challenge is no different. And if we actually proactively address these challenges, we'll have a healthier, sustainable, uh, more equal, inclusive society. If we do not, uh, then it's going to be a very chaotic destruction of uh, world civilization. Uh, there may remain pockets of civilization, uh, but uh, these are the sort of uh, the gravity of the situation. But it's also an opportunity uh, to make the world healthier, sustainable, more inclusive. So let's begin. Uh, so total energy consumption, this is restricted to uh, humans. Uh, by humans, about 8 billion humans on the planet uh, take, uh, uh, give or take a few hundred million. But basically, it's population times uh, per capita energy consumption. So total energy consumption is how many people you have and how much the average person consumes in terms of energy. Uh, so this is world population and per capita energy consumption. And then you multiply these two and you get total consumption. Uh, the timeline here, the references are here. The timeline is uh, year 1850 common era to about 2000. And uh, this is the latest data I found, but uh, the data is very similar. This goes on rising uh, like this. Uh, so from in 150 years here, we increase the population by 5.3 times with this as the base, 1850 as the base. In, in terms of what energy humans use, uh, these are pretty much most of it. Uh, what is not there and was not there as much in 2000 was um, really geothermal, uh, wind, and hydro. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, solar. Hydro is here. So solar photovoltaic or solar thermal, wind is missing, and geothermal energy is missing. Uh, but really, they will add a correction factor of 5 to 10% uh, around here for now. Uh, as they grow, uh, it, it, that percentage will be more. But humans really uh, primarily use this uh, in terms of energy scale. Uh, there is animal power and human power, uh, but it's fairly negligible in today's economy. So it's mostly uh, nuclear, uh, gas, oil, uh, coal. And of these, uh, the fossil fuels, gas, oil, and coal are pretty much about 80, 85% of this mix for total energy. So we have five times eight simple mathematics or arithmetic is 45. So total consumption, if 1850 is the base, we have increased by a multiplicative factor of 45, uh, 45. So this is not percentage. This is a multiplication. So 100 becomes uh, 4,500. Uh, so clearly on a finite Earth, uh, humans have occupied most of the Earth, which is livable. Uh, we do not have an other 45 times multiplicative factor for the next 150 years. So clearly, these graphs cannot continue forever. And that is a huge problem. Uh, this, in fact, uh, this graph will not even remain flat. It will go down uh, because we are uh, depleting coal, oil, natural gas. So now uh, that is the magnitude of the problem with energy. Here's a different problem. Um, so this is a model system. Uh, uh, this model, say, uh, some elephants in a sanctuary, say, maybe in Kenya or uh, southern India or uh, possibly Bangladesh. But um, so here is a what I call a fixed GDP model. That means elephants, the only thing they do is they breathe, eat, sleep, and reproduce. Uh, they don't construct things from the earth. They don't build houses. They don't have cars. They don't have electronic gadgets, watch television, and so on. So the elephants, as far as energy consumption is concerned, they are very simple. They breathe, they eat plants, they sleep, and they reproduce. So only energy required for these things they use. 
Uh, now, what is this model? Uh, this is time. These are arbitrary units of time. You may think of them as years or uh, decades or something like that. But it doesn't matter. This is a computational model only. Uh, and initially, in this sanctuary, uh, were uh, 50 ele elephants, 50. And if the number of elephants was 100, and exactly uh, each pair of elephants, mother and father, had exactly two offsprings, one son elephant, one daughter elephant. Uh, in This is a hypothetical model, model but on an average, uh, they kept the population in control. Then this is the carrying capacity of that sanctuary. That means they can live steadily for thousands of years. That means their energy source, which is plants and trees, uh, they will be in equilibrium. That means they will grow at the same rate using solar energy through photosynthesis of the plants. So the plants and trees will remain the same uh, and grow at the same rate exactly as the elephants consume them. So this is a steady state situation, and that's called the carrying capacity of the land. Can the energy be used in a steady state situation where uh, as much energy is coming into the land through geothermal or solar or wind or solar, what have you, uh, and that population can remain stable? Now, um, of course, elephants are not as intelligent, and they grew and grew and grew. The population kept growing because there were enough trees and plants. And for a while, they could grow above this limit because uh, beyond this limit, there were more elephants than the rate of growth of trees and shrubs and grass. So they could keep depleting this greenery. And then they reached a peak. What happened at this peak? They reached about 300. And now future elephants, future generation elephants, had less and less food to eat. So their population started declining. Some of them starved. They were born ill or could not uh, survive to adulthood because there was competition for uh, the trees that they had destroyed starting this point, which was steady state. And then the population of elephants kept decreasing. Some of the trees were lost forever. So what was originally a carrying capacity of 100 now became a carrying capacity of zero because slowly these extra elephants uh, started creating a desert. They would destroy trees or grass to the extent that even the seeds would not be there. They would also get eaten. So now, originally, uh, the <coughs> carrying capacity of the land, say, was a little more than 100. Suppose this is the red line. As they went into overshoot here, after some time delay, this carrying capacity started going down. Uh, and now the carrying capacity itself was zero. Now you could not have new elephants. Even if you introduce them, it was a desert. So this is basically what is going is happening to humans. Uh, we are at the uh, we are clearly in overshoot. Most scientists agree. Uh, the sustainable uh, human population for a middle income consumption level, say like Thailand or Turkey, uh, and uh, this is just to pick two countries which are middle income. They are not consuming too much. They are not consuming too little. And at that level, maybe one or two billion uh, uh, humans can only live in a steady state on the finite Earth. Uh, again, take these numbers with a grain of salt. There are a lot of error bars depending on the assumption. It might be three billion. It might be four billion. It might be one billion. It might be 500 million. But the important point is we are way beyond the carrying capacity. Uh, there are uh, way too many humans for the consumption we do. We can reduce consumption and increase, uh, or, or not increase, but at least sustain more humans. Uh, so we are clearly in this overshoot phase. The issue is when is the peak point, we don't know, but it's certainly not centuries away. It's probably a decade or two or uh, five decades away. So this is the issue with carrying capacity as you are consuming more and more of the finite resources. Now, uh, how does this all connect to physics? Uh, so we know from the second law of thermodynamics, entropy or disorder S scales with the system size. 
in any real life activity or process, delta S is greater than zero by second law. Now, some may point out there should be an equality for a reversible process. Almost all practical processes are not reversible. Uh, they have to be quasi-static. Uh, and uh, then it is equal to zero. The entropy of the uh, universe always increases in real life uh, human processes. More population means more materials under human consumption. That means the system size is bigger then larger the change in entropy. Uh, larger delta S means more destruction of carrying capacity or environmental destruction. And why do we say that? Because more and more entropy means more and more disorder. Uh, that's what this is. Uh, so if in your house, uh, especially in a tropical place like Bangladesh, if you don't keep cleaning the house, uh, bugs will take over very soon plants, animals in a hot, humid uh, climate, uh, even plants will take over your house very quickly. Uh, so you have to keep cleaning the house. That means locally within the house, uh, you have to pump out entropy. Disorder will quickly come in uh, if there is not active intervention and you use energy, that is you clean the house to pump out entropy out of the limited environment of the house. The entropy of the entire universe is still increasing, but at least you have pumped out entropy from a small system called your house and pumped it out. And you have to keep doing this. The day you stop pumping energy, more and more disorder will set in your house. Now, the same logic applies to the entire Earth. Uh, we need more and more energy if we want more and more of the Earth to be under human control. Uh, to have a particular type of complex order. Uh, so as your energy gets depleted, disorder is bound to occur. This is by the second law of thermodynamics. You can't wish it away. Uh, whenever there are laws in other fields like economics and they clash with fundamental laws of physics, physics always wins. Physics wins with uh, everybody on this planet as far as we are talking of material, energy, and uh, resources. So that is the issue now. And that's why physicists are getting more and more interested in this, in what is called biophysical economics. Uh, so, OK. So now, uh, the same equation you saw earlier, focusing on population, increasing only population continuously on a finite Earth, even if we keep GDP fixed, is impossible. So we are not going to increase our consumption, but we'll keep increasing population continuously. More population means more system size and uh, in our control, in human control, and then more delta S, more destruction of carrying capacity. That means less the capacity of the earth to carry that increased population. So this is not going to work. Anybody who talks about the energy problems in the world and doesn't talk about population, is uh, shy about discussing a problem or uh, uh, is they have just missed an important component. Now, uh, GDP and energy consumption. So uh, there is this is per capita energy consumption. We'll focus on that now. Per capita energy consumption directly scales with per capita gross domestic product. So what is gross domestic product? All governments across the world, no matter what the political system or beliefs, they are continuously worried about increasing GDP. The slightest whiff of recession throws most governments into panic mode because if GDP shrinks, uh, their understanding is employment shrinks and then you may have, and in extreme situations, uh, people may starve or not have enough goods and services and they will rebel, or if it's a democratic government, they will choose the opposition and throw out the current government. Uh, if it's a totalitarian government, there might be a violent revolution and so on. So everybody in government and high level policy making is always working in to increase GDP. This has almost become now 
uh, in the world of economics, government, policy, finance, uh, a axiomatic, it's an assumption nobody will challenge, that we have to keep increasing GDP, uh, gross domestic product. Uh, so now let's see what this gross domestic product, there are many, many definitions, but uh, here I have taken one definition, which is easy to understand. Uh, first of all, if your country, Bangladesh, exports more uh, and imports less, the GDP goes up. That's the definition. So you export more garments, leather goods, or what have you, uh, and import less, then GDP goes up. So this is easy. Now we can do a sum rule for the entire world, if you think about it, one country's exports is another country's imports. So really, if we talk about the earth, this is irrelevant. Uh, these exactly cancel each other by definition. So now let's worry about these two components. Now we are talking of the world entirely. So fixed asset is anything you build, uh, which is fixed to the ground. So typically, this is some building infrastructure. So for example, you build docks for shipping. You build schools and colleges, fixed buildings. You build mosques and temples and pagodas and churches fixed to the ground. Uh, you build government buildings. Uh, you build factories uh, to produce uh, goods and services. Uh, you build houses. You build commercial malls. Uh, anything building you build, it adds to GDP. And then finally, consumable products, whatever you eat, you clothe yourself, you buy cars or other services, uh, electronic gadgets, laptops, computers, phones, anything you consume has a very short lifetime. And what I mean by five is short is could be seconds, minutes, uh, years, or at most a decade or so. A car may last a decade or two, for example. Computers may last five, seven, 10 years. Uh, so basically, what is GDP? Whenever you build something fixed to the ground, that's positive. And whenever you consume, so instead of having uh, one scooter, one bike, one car, I'll have 10. And if you have 10, that means you have added to GDP. So the government will is very happy. You are consuming more and more goods. If per family there is a cell phone, and now per family there are four cell phones, each person has a cell phone, then uh, everybody, economists, uh, finance people, government uh, people are happy because we built 10 cell phones now instead of one and so on. So now this is interesting because anything you do, you use energy. So the energy consumption goes up. Uh, that means uh, more and more system size under human control of the energy goes up. The entropy goes up somewhere else. Uh, now, remember, you may have in decreased entropy in your house or your building or what have you, but you have increased uh, entropy total with the building and the outside combined. But now there is no outside to go to because the whole earth has been occupied by humans. So it destroys the carrying capacity of the land. So before we go on, let me describe what is carrying capacity for the elephants. It was easy, just the greenery in that sanctuary. What is carrying capacity for humans? Uh, for humans, we do agriculture. We need topsoil, fertile soil. If we deplete that soil of minerals, uh, essential minerals, vitamins, and so on, then the carrying capacity of the land has gone down because its productivity has gone down for grains, beans, uh, fruits, roots, whatever you grow. Uh, the same thing applies for water. Water tables in most of the world our underground water tables are going down and they are not being sustained with proper water management. Uh, so water, food, and then we looked at all these minerals uh, or finite resources uh, that are going down. In some cases, we are destroying um, animals and plant species uh, which are essential to our survival. For example, bees. Uh, that pollinate 10 to 15 percent of the food or more uh, honeybees uh, that help us grow food. So topsoil, fertile land, other materials, uh, many species which we live in harmony with. 
uh, they are essential for our survival even. So that is what is carrying capacity. So increasing GDP necessarily leads to destruction of carrying capacity, which will eventually bring us to the peak of human population and go down. And the carrying capacity we had 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago of the earth will also be depleted. So these are the issues of sustainability as they relate to energy. Now, so most people will counter argue that we have technology and humans will discover more and more technology uh, that will solve our problems. Uh, now, let's take a big picture view of technology. So what is shown in this graph, this is from Vaclav Smil's books. I think he has more than one books. They all are sharing similar ideas, but different in details, and they are fascinating. Um, he is in Canada. Some of this stuff you can find even online. Uh, but on the x-axis is per capita energy consumption in gigajoules per year of humans. Uh, so this is 300 gigajoules per year consumed by the average person in that society. Now, here are different societies uh, throughout history and currently. And these are the uh, energy used in food, in households, production, transportation, services, and so on. And you can see the food, food uh, is pretty much the same everywhere. A little bit more, but not much. Uh, we have increased the GDP and consumption in other items. So let's take Europe in 10,000 BC. Very little energy consumption at this energy consumption is mostly uh, food uh, and maybe some geothermal heat in um, caves and so on. But uh, combined, uh, if humans lived like Europeans in 10,000 BC, we could live for maybe 100,000, a million years on the planet. Egypt now, a little more higher civilization has evolved in 1500 before common era. Uh, so energy consumption has gone up a little bit. I don't know the source, but could be some uh, uh, wind turbines on water or other things. Uh, wood, maybe they were cutting more wood. Uh, China, uh, 100 BC. This is a factor of 10, another factor of 10 in time. And again, higher level civilization. Now, Europe in 1300s, I have an idea where this extra energy is coming from. Uh, more uh, efficiency, slight efficiency in agriculture, uh, hunting, fishing, more efficient. But mostly this is because of coal, uh, wood and coal. I mean, Britain probably had started depleting their wood source and they had discovered the use of coal. England, 1880, uh, again, this is mainly coal power uh, that is adding. Japan, 1990 is uh, nuclear, coal, natural gas, crude oil, all combined. Same thing with US, nuclear, hydro, uh, crude oil, natural gas, coal is, is doing all this. Uh, so that is the issue. So what you believe or I believe is technology is mostly finding ways uh, to use more and more energy, not for survival, but for luxuries. So whatever you think of technology, new technology, uh, it just means harnessing more and more energy. Uh, and uh, more and more energy used for GDP growth leads to destruction of, uh, uh, causes more entropy on the earth system, and then hence destruction of carrying capacity. So now let's recap all of this. Uh, entropy or disorder scales with system size, uh, and it's greater than zero. More GDP means more materials under human consumption, implies larger uh, entropy. Larger entropy means destruction of carrying capacity, and technology does not help a lot. What technology does is it brings forward in time future energy consumption. Uh, so we find better and better technology to mine crude oil or natural gas or coal. That means whatever was left for future humans, we just brought that uh, closer in time to us for current consumption and then depleted the earth of these resources because at the same time, we are also increasing population. Uh, okay, now for a long time, and what I mean by long time, 
is maybe a decade or two decades, five decades, a century, increasing only per capita energy uh, consumption continuously on a finite earth, even if we keep population fixed, is impossible. Uh, because as you, so let's say we kept the population fixed and said we will, the small number of people that exist will keep increasing energy consumption, GDP and so on, uh, is impossible because you will deplete all the energy sources. So now increasing population uh, and, and per capita consumption uh, will lead to chaotic destruction of population and orderly civilization. It will destroy both population and higher level civilization. As we understand, higher level civilization just means more energy consumption. That's all it means. So technology enables us to do that. Uh, so that is the problem in other words. Uh, so now, uh, can these be even kept constant? Let's suppose we say, OK, uh, we'll keep population constant where it is, 8 billion, and we'll keep GDP the same. Um, and uh, can we even keep this constant at the current rate? Uh, because every generation thinks whatever is currently in society is the normal society. 200 years ago, whatever people lifestyle they had, they thought that was normal. 1000 years ago, they thought that was normal. So currently, we are also under this uh, delusive idea, delusion, that whatever we are doing currently is, is normal. So can we keep this so-called current normal? Uh, now we come. to this idea of peak resources. So let's take crude oil, for example. When you plot the production of an aggregate oil field, it approximates a bell curve. So this is daily production from some newly discovered oil field. This is the first half, the second half. What happens is um, you dig more and more wells, uh, get more and more efficiency. And then as more wells come online, uh, the total production keeps increasing. And it comes to a point where you can dig more and more wells but it doesn't help. Uh, they are depleted. They produce less and less oil. And even the current well, the first well you discovered, now starts getting completely depleted. So the production goes down. So this is a geological fact uh, of uh, mineable resources. And this has nothing to do with uh, whether some government passes a law to mine more coal or uh, more oil and so on. Uh, at some point, every uh, well and every oil field, coal mine, uh, natural gas uh, mine will undergo this sort of curve. Of course, this is an ideal model. The curves are not as symmetric and as uniform. Sometimes they will go up like this, suddenly drop, go up a little bit. But basically, the general pattern remains the same. This is a physical law uh, uh, for finite depletable resources. And because you need energy to mine any other material, say gold, copper, iron, uh, whatever are industrial uh, metals, uh, they will also undergo the same law because this law applies to uh, all mineable resources. This is a physical law. It has nothing to do with uh, what humans do. We can do less than that. Say for a current crude oil field, we may go only up to this curve, stay flat longer, but the total resources is the area under the curve because this is production versus time. And that uh, will remain the same depending on how much resource is there below the ground. Uh, so this is for a car tank, gasoline use versus time. Contrast that with a car fuel tank. At midpoint, if you are driving on the highway, you can keep driving. The gas tank suddenly empties and you have zero time. But uh, the mineable resources are more following this kind of model. So, so from a geological peak, uh, production declines indefinitely forever, applies to all mineable resources, crude oil, natural gas, coal, uranium, uh, old water. Uh, uh, let's not get into that for now. What is old water and new water, metals, other minerals, and uh, so on. Even if uh, due to the presence of forests in an arable land for a long time, once you deplete the forest, 
and start agriculture. And if you don't uh, put the resources back uh, in the same area of the arable land, uh, the soil gets depleted and the soil will also follow some kind of curve. And we are depleting soil and water resources across the globe. Water tables in India are going down. Water tables in US are going down. Uh, water tables in Bangladesh are going down, in China, in Africa. Uh, so uh, we are destroying the carrying capacity for humans of the earth very rapidly. So, so basically, you cannot even stay constant uh, because our resources are depleting now. Some are already post-peak. Um, wait a minute, you may say. I thought renewables would save us. So what is the issue with renewables, wind and solar? That's the latest fashion uh, that we are going to solve the problem of continuous population growth and continuous GDP growth for everybody uh, by, by renewables. So let's look at renewables. No, renewables also will not solve this problem if we keep growing the GDP continuously with the population. Uh, because material sourcing is already a problem on a finite earth, then the materials required for uh, these solar panels and wind turbines, you can do an actual problem with data available, how much concrete and cement goes in these big wind turbines and the plastic encapsulation and the rare earth magnets that are present in here, uh, which are made of neodymium dysprosium, which are also required for your lithium ion batteries in electric vehicles and so on. So peak materials will also occur because the fundamental problem has not been solved, which is increasing population continuously and not just population, but also uh, consumption of energy and materials continuously, continuous GDP growth. Uh, so uh, that's a problem. Uh, this is, I'm quoting this from one of my favorite world citizen, uh, citizens and uh, Indians. Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need or every woman's need, every human's need, but not one man's greed. So this is fascinating. Uh, now millions of us are greedy. And what I mean by greedy is uh, we want higher GDP for our household. Uh, we want more TVs, cars, uh, scooters, uh, two-wheelers, uh, cell phones, televisions, uh, toasters, refrigerators, dishwashers, washing machines. Uh, we want to travel more. Uh, everything we do uh, causes us to consume more energy uh, and create totally more entropy in the Earth system as a whole and destroy carrying capacity. So in that sense, millions of us are greedy. Uh, and I don't mean to point fingers. I'm as greedy as the next person. Uh, and countries are also uh, greedy by that sense. On the top of the pecking order is, of course, uh, the US and some uh, countries like that, where the per capita consumption of goods and services is the highest. And uh, every other country aspires to the top dog status, which is the US or some other uh, extraordinarily rich countries that consume on a per capita basis, a lot of goods and services. And so in that sense, entire countries, regions, uh, peoples have become greedy now. So, uh, yeah, so Mahatma Gandhi here says, not even one man's greed can be satisfied on this planet or the universe, I may add. Uh, now millions of us are, so this is the problem. This is not a science and technology problem. Uh, this is a, a sociology, psychology, uh, human mental health problem. So then the next issue uh, is energy quality. Even if we get more energy, even if we find more crude oil, uh, it's deeper, it's harder to find coal or natural gas or uranium, what have you. Uh, here's an energy source. So let's say it is one meter deep, the crude oil. The energy for extraction is very low. So uh, from the energy source, subtract the energy for extraction. That's your net or, 
or the energy source net output is not net total output is this but some of it is goes in for extraction so your surplus energy is only e out minus e in so energy returned on energy invest is e out total divided by what is required to extract the source and if this goes less than one then it doesn't matter how much energy source you have because you'll spend more energy uh, than you will get out to use for your gdp so uh, basically there might be a lot of energy in the earth but if it is e out over e in e r o e i less than one then it's useless so we are lowering also e r o e i and hence net surplus energy so let's do the example the early oil found in the 1850s was barely a meter two meter three meters deep in the earth so it was very high quality of energy because you got lot of net surplus energy from a single barrel of oil now as you extract that now the oil is deeper maybe 10 meters deeper uh, uh, and then that quality is less because you need more work to extract that now how about 20 meters or 100 meters a kilometer two kilometers and so on at some point the energy of extraction is so high that it doesn't matter how much oil is there 50 100 200 kilometers below the earth you are never going to mine it apply this to natural gas coal uranium gold copper uh, what have you neodymium dysprosium and so on so the quality of the energy is also going down because in the last 150 200 years and in terms of coal thousand years uh, we have mined all the easy to use energy so just because somebody makes a wild estimate oh there are so many trillions of barrels of oil 100 kilometers deep in the earth uh, it's irrelevant for our discussion we'll never extract it. Uh, in the case of uranium the issue is not about uranium per se or plutonium or what have you uh, is the issue is of the uh, concentration so there's a lot of energy spent in nuclear energy uh, extraction in the sense of concentrating the ore and again the more the concentration it scales uh, like um, uh, something exponential e by kbt uh, of uh, to concentrate more and more uh, of the energy for nuclear fission uh, to take place so I, I won't spend much time on this uh, in the interest of time there's a little more uh, to cover uh, but this is the energy return on investment this ero ei and this is exajoules of total energy so this is the total quantity of energy and this is the quality so 100 is to 1 is a really high quality energy and then as you go towards one it's a poor quality energy so domestic oil in the us in 1930 high quality coal in 2005 high quality and these are potential i think uh, error bars the maximum and the minimum maximum and minimum this lies in a range because of the geography of the uh, mining site and so on uh, hydroelectric so now this is the best energy uh, coal is a little better uh, hydroelectric is lower imported oil in the us after 1970 us went through peak oil in 1970 and then domestic oil 1970 for the us firewood is much lower uh, and then imported oil 2005 getting lower windmills are lower natural gas nuclear domestic oil photovoltaics are much lower uh, and biodiesel gas oil is actually less than one uh, tar sands and so on so basically the point is look at wind and look at photovoltaics they are much lower uh, now with better technology this might be a little higher but on the scale of things what i want you to observe is wind and solar are on to the right and uh, the old oil from 1500 years ago is at a higher eoroei uh, that's the main point so renewables have lower energy density than the fossil fuels they are replacing so uh, renewables also have lower quality of energy than the fossil fuels so quantity is less quality is less and if you try to increase quantity you will undergo material speed so in the solar photo photovoltaic panel 
there is the transparent conducting oxide. There is the back contact, which is a metal. There is plastic encapsulation. There's the actual silicon or other items uh, in the solar cell, cadmium telluride, and so on. So all these are materials. You have to mine them. To mine them, you have to spend energy. And then you have to compare the energy you spent in making this solar panel and then the lifetime of this solar panel, 25, 30, 50 years, and how much solar energy this solar panel will capture. Uh, and if that energy uh, is higher than the energy you put in to mine and fabricate the panel, then, then that's a good energy. If that is lower, and as the materials speak, the mining energy goes up, and then the EROEI of the solar panel goes up. So you cannot, it's an impossible problem to continuously grow population and GDP, and then fulfill all the increasing needs with renewables. Uh, so this is basically uh, showing it in a different perspective. This is the Helmholtz free energy. This is the energy stored in a system and the entropy. And entropy is always eating away because natural systems want to uh, minimize uh, Helmholtz free energy or Gibbs free energy, whatever the relevant uh, thermodynamic function. Uh, so if you want to st stop this process of lowering, then uh, we need to pump energy into the system. And this is your all your energy sources. And then you will do some work against friction, again, entropy creating. And then you will be able to store energy as crude oil in a gas tank or for a ship or, or coal to make electricity or nuclear power, hydroelectric, photovoltaic, what have you. But you need to constantly pump energy uh, somewhere. So like population and material richness, high GDP is impossible without energy. Steady GDP with decreasing energy is an oxymoron or nonsense. Uh, so you can uh, increase GDP without increasing energy consumption for a short while uh, with some technology. Uh, but that's just a short while uh, and uh, uh, it will take uh, on a sustained basis for decades and centuries, you must increase uh, energy uh, to increase GDP. So otherwise somebody's uh, selling you snake oil. It's fake or a fraud or nonsense. Uh, uh, Dr. Kumar Das, can you hear and see me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so now, what is the effect of using low EROEI and culture, what we call culture, uh, art and science and music uh, and all of that, high culture? Uh, so this is Lambert and Hall. Uh, Dr. Hall is a pioneer in this field. Uh, this is from their 2012 paper. So society's hierarchy of energetic needs. Um, so uh, minimum EROEI for conventional sweet crude oil, he did this analysis for sweet crude oil, uh, which is a high EROEI product. Uh, wind and coal, uh, wind and hydro and solar are not so high. But anyway, let's let's take this example. It applies generally. Uh, so if, if the EROEI, you are getting only 10% extra energy uh, than the energy you spend, that is 1.1, you can barely extract the oil. You can't do anything with it. You can't run your car or anything, but it's only 10% uh, more. If you want to refine the oil now, it's 1.2. Maybe you can burn the oil at this level without refining. Uh, if you do 1.2 EROEI, you can do here. If you want to transport it from far away places uh, to the gas or petrol pump, then it's three, three is to one EROEI is required. Uh, to grow food, uh, then use the crude oil to run machines to grow the food, big genies machines and others, farm equipment. Then you need tractors, trailers, five is to one. Support family of workers working on the farm, you need seven, eight is to one. Uh, now you want your children to get an education, maybe high school education or university education. You need a lot of energy, nine, 10 is to one quality of the energy. If you want healthcare, hospitals, doctors, and so on, 12 is to 1. And arts and other cultures, uh, then you need 14 is to 1, including sports, by the way. 
uh, and theoretical physicists. Uh, you need 14 is to 1. So you get the idea as your EROEI go do goes down, you cannot have higher level cultures. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's the civilizational impact of low quality energy. Uh, now, you may argue, well, we'll do more energy efficiency. Uh, but energy efficiency, this is a new concept called embodied energy uh, that we have not encountered in the presentation so far. So to make any product, so this is megajoules per kilogram, megajoules per meter cube by volume. Uh, let's say you just want to create a straw bale. That means cut some grass and uh, make it into a bale of grass. Uh, and uh, the embodied energy in the bale of grass is very low. It's uh, megajoules per kilogram is 0.244, or but it has low density, so a lot of volume, so uh, or, or rather compact volume, 31 and so on. So different materials say, let's do zinc. Uh, zinc is 51. To mine zinc, you need a lot of megajoules per uh, kilogram. Uh, paint is 93. Linoleum, 116, polystyrene insulation, 127, and so on. So what this means is from the raw materials in the earth to make, say, copper wire for your buildings, uh, the raw copper, which is copper ore, very dilute in the earth, you have to mine it, refine it, and all of that. Uh, it requires for one kilogram of copper wire, for example, you will need 70 megajoules of embodied energy. Uh, so if you want to increase energy efficiency and they've put up these increasing uh, energy efficiency products, so these are insulation products and so on, that means you need a huge amount of energy to make the material in the first place. So this is window glass uh, in the US in a cold country, uh, you need a lot of insulation, specialized glass. It takes 15 megajoules per kilogram of this glass. So if you want to increase your energy efficiency, Eventually, you have to spend energy in those materials. Uh, so uh, here is something uh, that is required for your computer or electronics and so on. So if you have a cadmium telluride solar cell, it's megajoules per kilogram, 17. Iron, 20 to 25 for maybe a steel casing or something. Lead in some cases. Uh, copper, certainly, for the copper wiring in your computer or cell phones. Uh, some rare. Mercury is required, not necessarily in electronics, but uh, this is where it is nickel, aluminum, magnesium, silicon. This is electronics grade silicon. It is 99.59 uh, or 69. That means 99.99999 uh, purity silicon for electronics. Now that requires the purification process requires a huge amount of energy, 1000 megajoules per kilogram and so on. Silver is a back contact in a solar cell, zirconium, platinum for catalysis in many cars, uh, gold. And you see, that's why the price of platinum gold is high. It requires a lot of energy and so on. So any energy efficiency uh, uh, device will have a lot of embodied energy. Here are your uh, uh, home equipment, hair dryers, uh, LCD monitor that I'm using right now for this remote meeting. Uh, smartphone, PC tower, of course, is very large tower for communication, washing machine, and so on. Each unit costs so much megajoules of energy. Uh, efficiency will help a little. Of course, going forward, we need more efficiency. So it's going to help. Renewables like wind, solar, geothermal will help a little. These will all contribute. Uh, don't get me wrong. They will contribute some finite percentage. But... Uh, but the primary driver of sustainability is going to be these two. Population and high GDP uh, per capita has to be reduced first uh, uh, than these. Uh, so I think in the interest of time, I'll cut this out uh, just to say that uh, this has been predicted since about 1970 uh, by uh, Dennis Donella Meadows in this uh, data they collected in 1970, they put all these inputs into a model at MIT. Uh, they used a huge computer at the time. And they made these predictions for population, uh, food per capita available, services per capita available for humans, uh, industrial output, uh, 
global pollution and so on. And they predicted around in their standard model, they had different models, low resources, high resources, and so on. Uh, and then what Alan Turner in Australia did is he took their original simulation, which is the dotted line predictions. And what he said is in 2000, we have 30 years of actual world data. They made this prediction in 1970, he used actual world data to find out how the world progress along this prediction. And these solid lines are Alan Turner's computations. And he found that the world is pretty much following the prediction of the limits to growth. The original study was limits to growth. There are books uh, you can uh, find out. So in this limits to growth, original 1970, whatever they predicted, the dotted lines, the world is pretty much following that. So the solid lines is what Alan Turner calculated with 30 years of real data. Uh, dotted lines are predictions and so on. So uh, in this, the population is predicted to peak around 2030. I would warn that you should not take this number too seriously. The error bar might be two, three decades. Um, so it could happen in 2050, 2060 uh, if we take vigorous action. And if we take more vigorous action, maybe these curves can be flattened a little bit. Maybe this decline can be a little slower. Uh, but So the world is following the standard trajectory of what was predicted by the limits to growth uh, uh, model uh, conducted at MIT uh, in 1970. So, so I think I'll pause here. I'll, I'll just uh, sort of say uh, this is all unsustainable. And I'll come back to the solutions. And this is because humans have made a false assumption that continuous GDP growth means human development. This is completely wrong. Uh, and the correct observation is quality of life is related to HDI, human development index or similar indices like life expectancy plus years of schooling plus GDP. So GDP in this model gets only one third. And what we find is we can grow life expectancy, uh, reduce infant mortality, reduce mother's mortality, increase years of schooling, uh, increase uh, uh, health care, uh, health of entire populations without having to increase GDP. We can do this without increasing GDP. All these other quality of life parameters, grow more forests, grow more natural parks, and all of this, and it requires minimal GDP growth. Uh, but this is a good start. Uh, we have to eventually come up with a new index, and the United Nations uh, keeps coming up with better indices uh, every 10, 15 years. So this is one index the United Nations has designed, and certainly the GDP component is reduced, we can take it to zero and still have high quality of life. Uh, so develop improved HDI and grow its value. This is possible without consuming more energy. Uh, so Bhutan is a really good example of uh, uh, they, Bhutan came up with this general gross national happiness index uh, and uh, they have very low destruction of the environment uh, and they are doing this. So some similar models, it doesn't have to be the exact Bhutan model, but there's only one country I know uh, who has achieved a high level of happiness without increasing GDP. And I'm not saying they're perfect, but something along those lines uh, has to be developed. And then the other false assumption that humans have made is that uh, most GDP growth means destruction of carrying capacity, uh, rather development, development of carrying capacity. The true observation is most GDP growth, the way it is defined today, is actually destruction of carrying capacity. So define an environmental development index and the United Nations, I think, already has something similar and grow its value. So instead of focusing on GDP all the time, policymakers, economists, finance, people, business, all of us as a society, we should be focused on the environmental development index to make things more sustainable and then uh, HDI. And this is possible, by the way. This is not some utopian philosophical idea with no practical basis. This is all doable with current technology. Uh, how to attain this? Uh, 
we want to do birth control. Some countries did it by force uh, with a lot of human misery. This is total fertility rate. This is United Nations data. Uh, this is the number of children per woman. Uh, and uh, this is a linear fit to the data. Each dot here is a country. Uh, and the x-axis is percent of girls enrolled in secondary education. I think Bangladesh is doing uh, quite well in this regard, but they can do more. So here you have each of this is a country and any country with seven children or four and a half children per woman. Uh, and there's a lot of scatter depending on the culture. Uh, but you can see this is a good R square fit for the line uh, that as countries move down, uh, they, they end up moving down. More girls get education for more years. Uh, there's no dots here. Remember, if more women in a society are educated, more highly educated, uh, they don't prefer to have more children. They prefer to have less children. So the best way uh, without increasing human misery to reduce population is to have less children per capita. And the best way to do that is just increase the number of years spent in schooling uh, for uh, women. Uh, some of the current UN data suggests, for example, in Bangladesh, the average age of a woman at first birth is about 18.5. Uh, if that is just shifted a little bit, so 20 to 25, uh, the uh, rapid progress can be made along this line. So this, the whole world can follow. The only reason I pick Bangladesh is because I'm speaking to Bangladeshis. Uh, this applies to the US, China, India, what have you, Europe, Africa, uh, that uh, we need to put more girls in school for a longer time. Uh, and they will be happy, the whole society is happy, uh, and, and this will be a natural consequence. So there's no need of any force. Uh, and this is taken from an old uh, Roman Empire time. Uh, many, many roads lead to Rome. In Bangladesh, uh, I would say many, many roads lead to Dhaka uh, or in the US to Washington, DC. Uh, so we have to actively, and this, this has to be done. There's no need of more science and technology. Uh, we have to define human or individual capital, that is self-actualization, social or interpersonal capital, natural or ecological capital, and material capital. Right now, we are all focused on, focused on material capital. Instead of that, there is human capital, which is individual skills that a single human has. Social or interpersonal means the more and more NGOs, the more and more social groups a person belongs to, uh, then that is interpersonal capital. Japan is a country with very high social interpersonal capital. For example, there are others. Uh, but natural or ecological capital, Bhutan is very rich in this, uh, and material capital. So we have to move away from material capital proactively. This is a psychological process, a sociological process, not a science and technology process, from valuing this in society to valuing these three. So I think I'll end here. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if there are any questions, uh, there was more. Uh, what will happen in the end is uh, uh, more quality of life and so on. So maybe I'll just uh, emphasize one item here and, and then I'll end. So uh, there are two things that every single human can do right now. Uh, one is educate all the women around you at a high level and that will solve the population problem. And uh, this will solve the actively make life choices so that you value one's life and not in terms of material capital gain, but human capital, social capital, and natural capital. So that will take care of the increasing GDP problem. And something immediate one can do uh, is uh, this. So more and more data is now coming in. Uh, and now the economists the medical professionals, the top doctors, the nutritionists, the celebrities, the sportsmen uh, all across the world are discovering that the vegan whole food plant-based lifestyle is the best lifestyle for quality of life, 
as well as physical performance for the environment and so on. About 20, 15 to 20 percent of greenhouse gases are due to animal agriculture. Uh, and also, uh, as emerging economies like Bangladesh uh, move up in the GDP scale in affluence, they eat more and more uh, non plant products, animal products, eggs, chicken, poultry, fish, uh, mammals, and so on, birds. Uh, and here is a graphic. This is a profession. Uh, Proceedings of the National America of Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper from 2018, and they found that wild animals make four percent of wild mammals make up four percent of uh, total mass on the earth. Human agriculture, human cult controlled mammals make up sixty percent of the mass, and humans make thirty six percent of the mass. So really, as we move from material capital to uh, ecological capital, this percentage needs to increase a lot. This percentage needs to go down. And this percentage needs to almost go to zero. And what we are discovering now is the uh, best longevity and health uh, for humans comes from a whole food plant-based diet. So at the next meal, at your next dinner, breakfast, lunch, reduce the consumption of eggs, poultry, fish, mammals, other animals, and increase the value of plants and uh, the consumption of plants. And the best benefit is the individual benefits. Uh, as Bangladesh or other countries go richer, they tend to eat more animals. But if you don't do that, then you'll have less heart disease, less diabetes, less stroke, less of many, many other infectious and other diseases. The pandemic was caused by uh, the current theory is uh, interaction of uh, eating wild animals like bats by humans. Most pandemics, about 80% of pandemics are related to uh, dietary uh, animals by humans. Uh, so these are two or three things you can do immediately. Uh, uh, and then we'll have a very positive uh, lifestyle, less pollution, less climate change, great environment whole food vegan, less illness of affluence, more physical activity, less obesity. I didn't address that. This is more of a first world problem, not a emerging economy problem like uh, Bangladesh. Slower lifestyle, less stress, aging, high human development. We are not going to compromise human development by shrinking uh, GDP collaboratively, cooperatively, and in a sensible manner. Uh, greater overall quality of life. So I think, uh, I'll uh, end here. I went a little beyond uh, what was needed, but sorry for that. Uh, it's open for questions. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation, sir. So we have got few questions in the inbox. So if you allow, we can start discussion session. So the first question: the, Why do we need so, to go for renewable energy? for our sustainable human society. Uh, why do we need to what? To go for renewable energy. Uh, oh, that is very obvious. First of all, fossil fuels. I'll take nuclear later, but fossil fuels, uh, they yeah. are creating global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, primarily carbon dioxide, but there are others, uh, nitrogen oxides, methane, uh, for natural gas and so on. Methane is 25 times more potent uh, than carbon dioxide. Uh, the estimates are different, but I'm taking a mean estimate of about 25. Some, some estimates are 80, uh, 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide and so on. Uh, so that is going to cause uh, temperature changes on the planet and huge uh, climate problems. Agricultural production is going to be affected. Uh, distribution of plants, animal species across the latitudes is going to change. I mean, it's just sea levels are going to rise. Some models will suggest half or a third of Bangladesh will be underwater. Uh, so this is something we have to worry about uh, in a very serious manner. But let's put aside all the global climate change. Uh, we have not solved the problem of nuclear waste. That's another issue. Uh, so we are undergoing peak uranium. The grade quality of mined uranium 
is lower and lower in percentage. That means the EROEI on nuclear is lower and lower. Uh, so that's an issue. And we have not really solved the waste issue. Even the US, which has so much nuclear power, we have these nuclear power sites where we have stored tremendous amount of uh, uranium. And that's going to keep radiating uh, and affecting human health if not kept in isolation for a thousand years. The decay lifetimes are decades for the uh, nuclear waste uh, that you'll, uh, these decay lifetimes are there in standard tables in your nuclear physics class, if you have at a master's level or a senior level. So, so we have not even solved the nuclear waste problem. Even the US has not solved it. Uh, France has not solved it, which uses a lot of nuclear power. So there is a waste issue. And uh, uh, then the heat that is produced from the uranium nucleus is going to cause global climate change through the heat produced. I mean, there are so many issues. And then uh, even if, let's suppose there's no global climate change or global warming, there's the depletion of resources. Uh, you, uh, you will not have for the next 150 years, the crude oil, coal, and natural gas that we already burned. Uh, so uh, already a lot of countries in the Middle East have undergone peak oil. Egypt is a classic example. And hence the uh, uh, Arabian Spring that happened 10 years ago, uh, because Egypt is not able to export enough energy to carry on their society at the current level of GDP and so on. So Mexico is post peak oil and so on. So in any case, we are depleting the natural resources rapidly. If you are a 20 year old student in Jabna University, you're not going to have the same amount of fossil fuel energy when you reach 60 or 80. Your grandchildren are not going to have the same level of fossil fuel that you are using. So this is a fairly immediate problem. It's not something uh, 200 years from now. So hence, renewables are absolutely essential to the solution. There's no way about it, two ways. I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So uh, we have another question. So can you get our total required demand of energy from renewable, just for renewable, or we need to so, go for nuclear also? So first of all, nuclear, the uranium grade quality will is decreasing already, uh, even now. And if you increase uranium, uh, mining, the grade quality will get, keep getting lower and lower. Uh, already, I and an undergraduate student made some estimates. The nuclear EROEI is fairly low, somewhere between 6 to 15. Uh, so uh, wind and uh, solar are much better even than nuclear. Actually, there shouldn't be any nuclear power plants built in the future, in my opinion, because the EROEI is so low and it's going to get lower. And then there is the nuclear waste problem. Uh, we are already worried about terrorists all across the globe. Uh, now, if these terrorists discover this uh, radiating uranium in various sites across the globe at varying levels of security, then there is a security hazard. And so uh, nuclear is not going to solve the problem uh, unless we find a way to do it with plutonium. Plutonium is a little uh, more abundant, but nobody has found <coughs> scalable plutonium plant and there are pilot plutonium plants but there are no scalable india is in trying to do this for a long time but at least for 30 to 50 years india has not succeeded us has tried to do this for 30 to 50 years us has not succeeded other countries have research programs to get uh, high positive eroei from plutonium reactors uh, so uh, if if that breakthrough happens then i have a lot more hope for plutonium reactors than uranium reactors, the EROEI will be much higher. Uh, but I don't see any immediate breakthrough. Does that mean it will not happen in the next five years or 10 years? No, I don't know. As a scientist, I have to be of open mind. Uh, so that may solve it. Uh, but other than that, it's only renewable. But really, the primary solution is reduce population and reduce GDP. Uh, then the renewables will help. Uh, but that is not going to be the primary solution uh, because they will undergo peak materials. Already they are worried about lithium being adequately provided and barely uh, two, three, five percent of the global cars are run on lithium ion batteries. And anyway, lithium ion batteries are not a primary source. 
they are just a store of energy. Uh, you still need for increasing number of people to drive cars, uh, a source of energy. So there are so many issues with uh, just fantasizing, uh, doing techno fantasies, uh, which is what most of our scientists and engineers, not all, are proposing. So uh, go ahead. So this is, uh, I'll just take a, so this is, our actions will make the future. If we do nothing, this is just sort of a cartoon of a chaotic society fallen apart. This is techno fantasies. Most of uh, society is selling you techno fantasies, uh, which is not real. This is just a fantasy. N none of this is going to happen. Flying saucers and everything technological. Uh, if you work very hard for 50 years, uh, maybe your grandchildren will have this sort of egalitarian, environmentally sustainable, uh, peaceful, healthy, long-lived uh, human society. Uh, uh, and, and if two, three generations keep working hard, maybe our grandchildren, great-grandchildren will come close to this sort of uh, society. Okay, go ahead. I think I'm done with the answer. I hope that Thank suffices. You. Thank you, sir, for your uh, answer. So as we don't have any more questions, so we should conclude our discussion, sir. Okay. So thanks for your wonderful presentation. So we have learned a lot of things about this uh, uh, renewable energy and how we can make our uh, human society as uh, sustainable. So that will be very helpful for our uh, for new generation and uh, for us also. And uh, if we uh, follow uh, these things, uh, and then our uh, art will be livable and we can uh, sustain more time. So thanks again, sir, for your uh, uh, wonderful presentation. And thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kumar Das and uh, Pabna University and all the audience yeah. members who uh, saw and listened to the presentation. Uh, I am uh, grateful for uh, being able to present these ideas to you. Thank you. Yeah, it's my honor, sir. And it's my yeah. honor and privilege to host you in our international program. So bye for today, sir. Have a nice okay, day. Okay, bye. Yeah, you too. Bye.